the role as the host for the speaker today. It's really my pleasure to introduce to you, to you Dr. Jesse Gold, who I uh, met for the first time uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, she was introduced to me as the inaugural wellness officer for the University of Tennessee Health System. And I got very intrigued about what that actually means because we don't have a systems-wide wellness officer as far as I know. Um, Dr. Gold <clears throat> is one of our own, meaning she is trained as a psychiatrist and she actually is now a member of the Department of Psychiatry chaired by our own Dr. Ron Cowan. But her job is not limited to the field of psychiatry, really helping the whole health system. And she would most likely tell us a bit more about how expensive that health system is to advise the administration and clinical leaders on a very challenging topic, which is how we can keep ourselves well taking care of others. So without further ado, Dr. Jesse Gold. Do I need to like, do I need the mic to go down because I'm short? No, I don't. Okay, I was just, I'm used to that. That was a reflex. Hi everybody, thanks for letting me talk to you. Um, just, he said I had no disclosures, but I don't have disclosures, but I just I also disclosed that I wrote a book that has some of this content in it, just so that it, it doesn't technically count as a disclosure, but it's a disclosure for me. Um, so you know that. The other disclosures that I tend to do, these are my personal disclosures, which is wellness is complicated. I have the identities that I have, and so I can't speak to all of the different intersectional uh, aspects of wellness as a person experiencing them, but I see healthcare workers as patients. I see lots of different people as patients who kind of go from there. I also don't represent the University of Tennessee and the things that I'm saying. Um, I use a lot of humor. It doesn't mean that I think this topic is something that's like funny. It's just that sometimes it can get a little dry and can feel a little hard to keep hearing that stuff. So don't think that that's why. And then the last thing is sometimes when I talk about COVID, you had existed during COVID, it can feel bad to listen to. So I try to warn people that's the case. Probably the most common reaction to listening to me talk about well-being is anger, though. And I think that's just because, like, I don't know, I've, I've come to represent sort of like the man in a lot of ways because, like, people come and give you talks and then it's like a checkbox and that's the answer, right? So hopefully I, it won't feel like that to you, but I'm aware that's the case. So if you, like, want to rage at me later, you can this just is like to give you a little sense of what my job is. You live in this state, so I shouldn't have to tell you what Tennessee looks like, but I often, like when I moved here, I was not aware that it was as long as it is. Um, <laughs> I, I grew up in Florida and I was like, it's the same, it's kind of like the same length as Florida is down. And I had no idea that was, that that was true at all. Um, I'm based in Memphis at the Health Science Center but my chief wellness officer role is over all five campuses. So um, that's all the UT campuses, which is about almost 60,000 students. Um, and then staff and faculty is almost, it's like more than 19,000 um, across the whole state. And my job is sort of to figure out <laughs> what's going on for wellness in all those places and try to get them on the same page in some capacity, not step on toes where I can, that kind of thing. Happy to talk more about it if people are interested, but it's not the point of the talk. Um, I'm gonna do my best to define burnout in healthcare and talk a bit about what COVID did, but really because this is a room full of psychiatrists and I'm a psychiatrist to talk specifically in our field because I think we don't do that enough. Um, talk about healthcare culture because that's also one of my favorite topics and why that is a problem. <laughs> um, and then talk a little bit about strategies. Um, if you've ever, ever seen me give a talk before, I apologize, but every time I give a talk, I start with this. And the reason why uh, I start with asking ourselves how we are and grounding ourselves in that is like, probably this is the first time all day you've sat down and had anything to do except for emails or talk to patients or anything else. And so you probably have not yet even noticed that you are also a human doing that job. Um, so I put it in there to remind you so you can take a second to ask yourself how you're doing, also to remind myself. Um, when I do that, it's been like this for a while, which is like, my mental health's great if you don't want to talk about that, right? Or if I don't think about anything. And I think there's a really common sort of way of approaching things, especially in healthcare, which is like, 
it's cool. Like if we don't talk about stuff, I'm probably fine. Right. And I think that just makes it so you kind of keep going and going and going until you can't, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're actually doing fine. Right. Um, I'm going to talk a little about my own story because I think it helps like ground this content a little bit, but also normalize it. Um, so during the pandemic, I was at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, I was a psychiatrist seeing frontline workers in the employee and family clinic. And I <laughs> somehow got nominated by myself um, to be in charge of employee and staff wellness for the whole hospital system. Um, basically by asking a question, which was like, who is doing that? Um, so I was running around giving like, I don't know, 10, 15 talks a week to different p people on campus, like virtually, and then eventually in person, um, and seeing patients and had a lot of like, I'm a psychiatrist, I'm at home, I'm safe, I'm fine. And like a lot of guilt. And I think compensated for the guilt by overdoing it and doing a lot for everybody else. Um, and in that context, just started like falling asleep every day after work uh, all the time um, and just kind of blew that off, as I say we do. Um, and I hadn't really thought a lot about it besides the fact that sleeping and then messing up my sleep at night was like really getting in the way of my life. And so like I started to do a lot of expert <laughs> things on burnout. People started asking me questions. And one of the reporters was asking me expert questions and at the same time was like, has anyone asked you what this experience has been like for you? And I said, no, but I'm happy to talk about it because I knew her and I didn't actually feel like it was a trick. But then she wrote me an email and said, so the content of our article changed. And I was like, okay, what's that mean? Um, so I opened the article. <clears throat> Both of these I put up as examples, but the one I'm talking about is the New York Times one. And I was the lead. So the lead means that my story is like a burnt out burnout expert was like earth shattering enough that the New York Times thought that's why people would read the article, right? Like it's novel enough that people were like, no way is that a true thing. Let's get people to read this article with this lead in. And <laughs> I didn't know like at all that it would be something like that. I kind of thought if it was mentioned, she'd say something like, and she's had burnout too, but it, it, it didn't come off like that. It was very much the whole context of the article, which made me like reflect a lot on the fact that we obviously don't talk about this enough. And we're obviously not talking about it enough in our field, um, but healthcare in general, that it was so shattering, for, like earth shattering for people. And I tried to think about like my own experience with that and like, why didn't I even know that that's what was going on with me? And why am I falling asleep after work and being totally okay with it? And I kind of think me, patients kind of fall in these like couple of steps that at least I experience, which is like the beginning is like I was talking about, we kind of just like ignore it. But at the same time, if you see people for all the same stuff, you're like, that's what's going on with you. And I can tell because I am an expert in this and this is how we help with that. But you don't at all apply that to yourself, um, which is an interesting thing. I think it particularly happens in psychiatry because I think that we think that any mental health thing we can manage on our own because we learn coping skills and someone taught us coping skills and we learn psychotherapy so we can psychotherapy ourselves, right? And so I think we have like an added layer of complication to that. Um, just so we're like on the same page in, in verbiage and conversation. So burnout, like all psychiatric terms or like all terms related to mental health is very overused. I think people use it like work was hard. I'm burnt out. That's not at all what it is, but I get it. I know why they do that. It's the same reason people say they're depressed when they're sad. Um, but what it really is, if you're looking in research, is this constellation of three things. The first thing is emotional exhaustion which looks a lot like physical exhaustion in people, but it's just sort of like by the end of the day, you've had enough. Um, the second is depersonalization. Depending on who you ask, it might also be cynicism. So we use depersonalization in healthcare just to like not get patients stuff inside of us when we're talking to them. But this is like an extreme version of that, which is that you're, you're still disconnected all the time and not just in patient settings, but you kind of go patient to patient, just like, eh, it's another one, and it's another one. I often describe it to people like that thing that makes you really good at what you do is the thing that's missing. So it's not like you're making errors or have gone to that far of like what pretty much makes people show up in my door, but it's more like 
if somebody went to see you because you're the doctor who has always cared in this certain way, like you probably are not doing that as much. Um, cynicism just means you're like cranky, right? Like you're a little bit, everything is negative. And so that's also a thing that you would notice. The last one is a sense of reduced personal accomplishment. So that I don't think needs definition, but I will say that's the one that most people notice. So like, eh, I'm tired, I'm emotionally exhausted, I'm supposed to be, I'm a doctor. Oh, I'm depersonalizing more, must have been a hard week. Oh, someone else might notice that I'm not doing my work, that's a problem, right? Or I'm noticing I'm not as productive, or I'm noticing that I'm not getting as much done and I don't feel good about it, then it's a problem. That's the most common thing. Um, another way to kind of think about it is it's the difference between what you think work's going to be like and what work actually is. So like when you're in medical school, you're like, I just want to help people. When you're joining faculty, you're like, it was really fun to help people and also like mentor people, right? And then when you actually do the work, you're just like documenting and doing inboxes. And I don't think people like wrote essays about that being the thing they wanted to do. And as a doctor, right, you weren't like, it'd be great if I spent all day on a chart. And so that difference in between what you think that it's going to be like and what it actually is like is also what, what burnout is. Um, depending on who you ask and what study and how they do it, it's about 50% in, in trainees and practicing physicians, which is, is more than uh, basically age match peers, but also educationally match peers. So people who go to the same amount of school. In psychiatry pre-COVID, this is the best study on it. There are not a lot of studies on it. We don't like to study ourselves, but... Um, in this one, we had 78% burnout, which I told you 50 was high. This is very high. Um, and then 16% had moderate or severe depression. And I think that's also worth paying attention to in your head. Um, higher burnout associated with depression. You'll see that across the board in studies. They're very linked. Um, it's not the same. And I don't have to tell psychiatrists that, but it is very linked. Um, female gender, lack of control over schedule, I think also makes sense. And then practicing inpatient community and, and government settings a lot of places where you're seeing a lot of the world interact with the patients and things you can't help necessarily. Age is inversely associated. It, it makes sense, I think, if you think about the control aspect. So younger, you have like probably more, like a little less, at least, control over the things that you're doing and your schedule and things like that. And as you get older, hopefully you get more control just as you grow in leadership. And so that tends to be where that comes from. After we sort of like ignore it, I think our next step is to sort of go like, but medicine is hard. And so I'm supposed to feel bad, right? Like the, my job just is supposed to make me feel bad. Um, my favorite tweets from about that time of uh, especially this one is like being a therapist right now feels like handing out sunscreen to people who are on fire, right? Which basically just like if, if feeling ineffective is part of burnout, how are you supposed to feel effective if the fires keep coming, right? Like you just, it's very hard to feel good. And I remember like early on, but continuing to COVID, like meds weren't, what was a med doing? And I'm seeing a lot of people who are like healthcare workers who don't even really want to be on meds. But if I start meds, like there's still a healthcare worker going on the wards in the middle of a pandemic, right? So it's really hard to feel like you're doing things. I have to remind myself that our presence is also doing something and listening is also doing something, but it doesn't feel like that all the time. It feels better when people like get better, right? Some of that too is this like, we're just really bad at identifying stuff in ourselves. This is like one of my favorite studies, but without a doubt, when I mention it, two things are brought up. And one is that the N is small. And the second is that it's surgeons. Um, I'm aware that surgeons are a specific population of culture and medicine, but I actually think that we would have similar things across the board. This is just the group they chose to study. But in this group, they had the people who they, they had them all do the Mayo Wellbeing Index, which is like a common measure of well-being that's used in medicine. And they had the people who scored in the bottom 30% versus like lots and lots of norms that they've accumulated over time. And they said, so how'd you think you did? And 71% of them said that their well-being had to be above average or at average, right? The people in the bottom were like, I'm doing good, right? Which means that somebody who's not sleeping can find someone who's not sleeping a little bit less, right? <laughs> and then you can find somebody who is like not looks about as sad as you. So that seems good. But like, just because medicine somehow has decided like not sleeping, not eating, not functioning, being sort of burnt out and being sort of depressed is normal, does not mean it actually is. But it does mean 
that it's really hard to figure out if like what you're experiencing is something wrong, right? Because you're kind of like, maybe this is just what we do, right? But it also does is make it really hard when you actually want to ask for help because no one else seems to be and everyone else seems to be also as depressed. So it's really hard to know, like, is it just me? And somehow I'm not cutting it in that context because we've defined the context so poorly. Importantly, too, is nothing to do with resilience. Um, I'm not an anti-resilience person, but I am a we've used resilience incorrectly person, meaning often when you say resilience to a room of healthcare workers, they're like visibly cringe, pretty much like having a wellness lecture. But it's because what happens is like we decided that we were going to fix things with resilience, that the answer was resilience. It wasn't oh, this is a broken system with problems and also learning resilience could be helpful or learning skills could be helpful. It's not that the system's not broken. It's that if you'd like to survive inside of a broken system, you might need some skills to do so, right? But in the same respect, also important to note that no matter where this is studied, we're much more resilient than the general working population. It is like more resilience, less burnout, but even the most resilient person still has burnout. So it's not just that, right? The next thing that I did was this fun game of like, it's not a, anything about my mental health. It's a physical health problem. It's sort of embarrassing. I went right there given what we do for our job, but it is where I went and I was convinced like sleep all day, like feeling tired. There's like lots of things that make you feel tired. So I went to my primary care doctor and was like, fix me. And I had to basically like pull teeth to get her to even do labs because she was like, I don't think that's what's wrong with you, but I like made her do labs and I had low B12. So then I was like, I fixed it because everybody gets B12 shots feels better. And that's the answer. I just need B12 shots. And once I get B12 shots, like I'll just go back to doing my job just as good as I was. And um, I got B12 shots and that did not solve the problem. And so that made me very mad. Um, the next thing that I think a lot of us will do is like, if I could just get to that vacation or I can just take an extra day off, if I can just, and that does help, but it's not an answer, especially in the long term. My personal therapist describes it as like, we're sort of like a boat in the water with holes in it. And you like take the weekend off or you take a long weekend and you float a little higher in the water because you took a couple of pails of water out of the boat, but you're still a boat with holes sinking in the water. So like, you're going to go right back down. Right. So all I think of for days off is like, they're great. We should have them. We should take them. But in the same respect, we kind of have to like know that if we're going right back to the same environment, you have to adjust with that time off. I don't do that very well. So, you know, that didn't help. Um, so I actually didn't even know I was burnt out until my personal therapist told me I was. Um, I said, it's not the B12. I took vacation. I'm doing everything you're telling me. And I'm still falling asleep every day after work. And this is really annoying and I like need to work right and she's like uh-huh and so I was like I'm not depressed I know I'm not depressed and she's like I don't think you're depressed and and she's like but you are a frontline worker who sees frontline workers in the middle of the pandemic like what else could it be and I just started I I laugh when I'm uncomfortable I laughed a lot and then I she's like why are you laughing and I was like I'm burnt out right I just gave a lecture on burnout yesterday right so I had no clue at all that I couldn't apply any of the things I was like running around telling other people to myself. And she said, well, that's why people go to therapy because you need other eyes and you're not your own doctor. And I said, good point. But also it's embarrassing a little, but I think in telling you this, what I mean is like, if, if I literally live in burnout all the time and my job is burnout and all I do is talk about burnout, like if I can't identify it, why should anyone else? Right. And I think that's really important because we kind of think these are like easy signs and symptoms and easy things to notice. And they're not because they're actually easy things to blow off and easy things to say are just like a, something you're supposed to have as part of healthcare. So how did COVID make all of this more interesting? Um, so I think there's like some view that like we were fine, COVID made us bad, and COVID goes away and we'll be fine, right? I never made that viewpoint, but someone has that viewpoint. And a lot of those people have purse strings. But either way, I will say that that doesn't make any sense. I showed you the numbers before COVID. We were horrible before COVID. Then we came and had all these extra stressors. It's not going to be magically better. It wasn't good before. It's worse now. 
And it's, and the fun thing about mental health stuff, which I don't have to tell you is like, who knows when that stuff is going to pop up. There's no good timeline for that either. I like this image. Um, it's used kind of thinking about disaster impact and outcomes. And the reason I like it is because we talk a ton about the COVID medical footprint, and it probably is about as big as that psychological one when we talk about it, but we don't talk about the psychological one as much as we should, even within psychiatry, I think. Um, and if you think about that difference, as much as we've talked about the medical one and as many people were infected by the medical one, it's gonna be a really, really big psychological one. Probably more really than I could sit here and tell you because it's gonna be that much of a big difference. And that's really important to keep in mind. Um, in healthcare workers, kind of like what we're seeing, um, this is CDC data. Um, their study had 32% of people being burnt out in 2018, it goes up to 46. Um, in, interestingly, but probably not in terms of sort of culture and environment harassment, more than doubled for their study. Um, I think that has to do with that's going to make you more burnt out if you're not feeling good at work or safe at work. Um, trust goes down in management and then turnover and tension goes up, right? So I think for doctor people to even check a box that says they might not want to be a doctor anymore is like a huge thing. So our identity, money, lifestyle, pretty much like all of these years of our time are very wrapped up in that degree. So even to say you might leave is a big deal, I think. But those numbers are things that we should be paying attention to and not like kind of glossing over. Um, looking at sort of the mental health workforce, um, because in part because not all of us are going to be psychiatrists, but also we're referring to psychologists and they did better studies than we did. Um, this is their APA like survey and sort of what they're looking at. And more than half of psychologists say that they're working more than they did before and seeing more patients. It shouldn't surprise you, but that's just going to tell you that like that big footprint thing is coming off like this, right? In our job, that big footprint means more patients, more work. And that is a big deal. And that's something we should be talking about. I did this study mostly because my inbox looked bananas after COVID, or like during and then following after COVID. And I was like, I need to prove that I'm not making this up. Um, and so I, we looked at inbox messaging over COVID to the mental health practitioners. And it basically went up like monthly message volume went up 861%. Like that's bonkers. That's a lot, <laughs> right? We're not paid for messages. A lot of times it's not factored into our admin time. That's a lot of time spent answering people's messages. Some of that you might ask is like, did we give them too much time in front of a computer and now they just use it more? Is it they're more anxious? Who knows? There's lots of reasons behind that. But either way, like this is sort of another product of what you'll see in sort of our workloads and how that's going to lead us to feel more burnt out in a workplace post COVID, even if it's not about COVID, right? Like this is all sort of like the impact of it. Also, there's this other thing that's worth talking about, which is this concept of moral injury. Um, I think it's worth talking about because I think we don't talk about that enough either, but it's a very common thing that we're feeling in medicine. Um, anytime there's a QR code, by the way, it'll like take you to the article or take you to more information depending, but usually the article. Um, so if that's something you want, you just like scan it. But this is a piece I wrote on being the moral injury part. And that term is like, again, came out of the military. We love to come out of military terms, but basically they didn't want to call it PTSD because it wasn't. Um, and what that is, is it occurs when someone engages in or doesn't prevent or witnesses something that conflicts with their morals and dies. That's a big thing in medicine. So uh, commonly, you probably saw this talked about with things like ventilators and not having enough or beds and not having enough. Um, it's talked about now a lot with some of the like sort of political in intersection with medicine and how that might be impacting decision making. Um, but I also think it's important to note that like some of it is not that dramatic. <laughs> like those are big things that you're going to hear about and know. The piece I wrote was about ADHD medication shortage, right? Somebody needs a med. You can't get them the med. You keep trying to get them the med. You can't because it doesn't exist. No one's helping you get more meds for those people because they're stimulants and they don't want to give them to them. <laughs> so they're not making an effort to do it, right? So there's all these things that are making it so you know what the right move is and you can't do the right move and that's another way to get it, right? So we have these like little episodes of moral injury if you wanna, you know, like that are occurring throughout our 
practice that we probably just aren't identifying that way because it doesn't feel like a big thing. But if you like think somebody's hospitalization should be covered and insurance doesn't, that doesn't feel good either, right? If you have to kick them out because you can't keep them in, right? There's all these forces that kind of contribute to what we're dealing with every day. And also, I just would point out too that like if psychologists can't meet their demand, all these people are going to be sitting in psychiatrists not getting better either, right? Because all of our all of our stuff is much better if people are actually getting care. And I think it's very important that we're sort of like aware that we're holding a lot of those people. Our own wait lists are big anyway, and we're hoping that they could get the extra care they need for like good treatment. And some of that's going to feel like more injury, right? Like I would like this person to get a therapist, but there are no therapists. There's no therapists that look like them. Therapists are expensive. Therapists take time, right? All those things are things that are going to keep somebody with you not getting maybe the best treatment that they can or not helping meds to the best that they can be helped because of all these things, right? What does that actually look like? It really looks like stress reaction. I would say the most common in us is the overworking thing. If I just keep working, then this like won't be a problem, right? Nobody will, nobody will notice. I don't have to talk about it. I can just keep working often leads to like guilt, shame, and anger, and eventually can lead to PTSD um, in some people. When you kind of look at like, okay, so what's the difference between burnout and moral injury? The big thing just to sort of like keep in your head is that moral injury is called moral injury because it's a violation of morals. And you could have the same symptoms as a result, but it's the way you get there that's the difference. So burnout's really like all of these things in the system in the workplace that are contributing to you having more workload, you having you feeling ineffective, you feel you're feeling um, disconnected. But the moral injury part is like you saw something, you couldn't help, you witnessed something that was wrong, and then it led to similar symptoms. Still, like you know, besides all those really uplifting data that I gave you that said we're burnt out, then we're more burnt out, and yay, it's not any better, which is my favorite part of the lecture. Um, the even more exciting thing is like, despite all that, and despite the fact that probably somebody's told you statistics before, we still don't actually do much about it, right? Um, this is my favorite quote, um, because I think it's really like helpful to think about, which is like the expectation that we can be immersed in suffering and loss daily and not be touched by it as it's unrealistic as expecting to be able to walk through water without getting wet, right? It's so like our job is a literal downpour all the time. So eventually that's going to affect you. It's not right to assume that it won't. We should assume that it will, right? Um, however, it's not the case. This is like from the kind of height of COVID. It's a polling study. So those researchers in the room, please take that with a grain of salt. Um, but basically, you know, a lot of people saying that they had increased worry and stress, a lot of people saying they had mental health outcomes, only 13% actually got services. These are frontline workers. And 20% said like, I probably should have, right? And then when you kind of say, why didn't you? I think it goes in two buckets. One is systems, right? And the systems are too busy, can't afford it, can't get time off. Those make a ton of sense. Those are big systems problems that need to be thought about by people in roles like me and thinking about that and trying to fix that. But those are gonna feel very frustrating if day to day you're trying to solve that <laughs> because you probably don't have the power to magically make it so you can change a policy, right? There are lots of steps in that. The thing that I like to lay my hat on for like an, on an individual level, on a group level is this like afraid or embarrassed to seek care bit. Like, that shouldn't be as high as it is. That's almost honestly embarrassing to me that it's as high as it is, but it's worth talking about all of this because if we got those 17% to go get care, then we're like, really just need to focus on the system, right? Those are cultural problems. That's how we talk to each other. That's how we talk about getting care with each other. That's how we like approach someone who might have a mental health condition in the workplace. Um, you would maybe say, but I'm a psychiatrist. I don't do that. Um, but we don't like to get help either, right? Like I, when I was in residency, people encouraged it and said to do it, but then it wasn't as easy as it would seem, obviously, for lots of reasons. But, you know, I think as a profession, we are much better at encouraging these things than other professions in medicine, because we understand sort of the impact of patients on our ability to do care. Like if we don't understand why we're reacting a certain way, it can affect the care moving forward. But it doesn't mean we like actually get help. And a lot of it is this 
I don't have bad, my symptoms aren't bad, or I can do it myself, right? And obviously we are busy too, but we also have this like, don't want to risk disclosure thing. So, you know, as much as we're like, mental health is normal, blah, blah, blah. When I talk about like, I was told not to self-disclose by pretty much everybody that I've ever worked with. And a lot of that's like, well, you're supposed to be like a blank slate person that nobody knows anything about. And I was like, I don't think I can function that way. I'm sure somebody can and like they should be a psychoanalyst, but I don't think I should be a psychoanalyst. Um, and that didn't get me very far. Um, so um, let's talk a bit about medical culture. Hopefully this video works when I push it. Nope. How do I make it work? Do I push it again? Uh, sir, could I talk to you for a second? Oh, sure, Bill. What's going on? Well, my cousin's getting married next September. I was hoping to take the day off to go to the wedding. Cutting it a little close. That's only a year away. Yeah, I guess. Have you completed your paid time off proposal? Yeah, here it is. I got it notarized like you asked. I've included three references and a detailed itinerary. I'm sorry, Bill. We just can't risk it. What? I found backup to cover me while I'm gone. But not backup to the backup. Bill, you know we have to have five lines of backup before we can let a resident take a day off over a year away. Well, can the attendings cover? I need you to think long and hard about what you just suggested. What? You expect an attending to practice medicine without the help of a trainee half their age with a fraction of their experience? Hey, admin. Oh, surgery. What can I do for you? I'm going on vacation. Oh, okay. When will you be back? I don't know. See ya. Well, have a great time. So <laughs> his videos are all great. And a lot of them are about sort of the medical system and the ways that they're not funny, but are funny. Right. Um, I like this because it really like highlights, like, how do you care for yourself in an environment like that? Right. If there's no redundancy, if you need to plan a year in advance, if you know, I can tell you stories of so many people who are like proud to have worked while having a miscarriage or throwing up and carrying an IV pole and all this stuff. And it, that's like our, that's, that's okay. So if you have to be visibly throwing up and that's still, you should be working at what point does like a invisible illness count, right? Like if you're burnt out, it's never going to reach the point of like active hemorrhaging. So you're never going to count it. It's never going to be okay to take time for that, right? I also put this other image here because it, it I, I don't know, it's our dark humor, but I think there's also real like points worth talking about within it. It was an actual sign in the height of the pandemic in a, a restroom. Um, I thought, you know, asked the person if they thought it was a joke and they said probably, but I don't know that that's any better, right? And I think, and I think that's true, right? Which is like, we basically are saying like, well, you're working in a hospital during the pandemic, it's miserable, but go, go cry in the bathroom, right? And that's like funny to us, which probably means our culture is a little off. That's a nice way of putting it. So I like this article, it's in the BMJ, like right around the time that Simone Biles uh, said she wouldn't compete in the Olympics and sort of looked at like, what do elite athletes and elite academics, if you want to call us that, have in common, right? Like, how do we process these things? And like, what could we learn from her decision and apply to our life, right? I'm not going to read it to you because you can read and you shouldn't read it right now anyways. But really what it says is like, there's some people who are very competitive and want to help people. And that's how we're self-selected because those are the qualities we're supposed to have to go to medicine. And then as a result, we're overachieving helpers. And we go to a school where they tell us like, you have to do better than other people to get spots. So then the overachieving helpers are like pitted against each other. And so as a result, like you don't actually want anything that the other people don't have that can make you be less of a successful competitor. So you're not going to see, you're not going to talk about yourself and you're going to say that like being vulnerable is a failure, not a strength because, well, they're not talking about it and I have to compete with them. So even if I am a helper person and kind of understand it, it doesn't matter. And so as a result of sort of like setting the bar there, anytime we have mistakes, which we do because it turns out we're human. There, the fall is much greater. Like we aren't prepared for it. Nobody talked to us about it. We didn't think we were supposed to. So when we do, it does not go over very well. Um, this is sort of like this concept of self-valuation, which is like when we make a mistake, do we blame ourselves or do we say like, I can learn from that? <laughs> um, physicians are about 50% higher than other fields to be like, it's on me. 
like that was me, that's that, you know. And if you adjust for that difference, that big, big burnout difference in physicians versus other fields goes away. It's not to say that's the only thing, but I'm very big on like telling you things you can do yourself to maybe feel better. And this is a fixable thing. Doesn't mean every time you have a mistake, you're gonna be like, yay, that was awesome. Keep making mistakes. But it does mean that like you can sort of hear yourself not being nice and try to change that. And that might be helpful to get through it, right? Another thing to keep in mind too is like, we could say, well, like we're in healthcare, we don't have stigma. Eh, I wish that was true. But you know, if you look at this as a medical students, the top is like, it's a personal weakness to get help. Very low, like they don't think that's true, but they think everyone else thinks that, right? So personally, they don't think that it's a problem or a weakness, but they think their supervisors will, residency directors will, their, their coworkers and other students will, and that patients will. How is it at all possible that those nice little people who went into med school saying, this is good, I love emotions, they matter. Like, how do we come out okay from that? Because everybody else, we, we're afraid everyone else is going to do that. So we're going to have to change to fit in or to get through, to succeed, to compete, right? And as a result, the bottom line, right, if I were to get treatment, I would hide it, is like over 50. It's, it's a lot, right? So we might not think it's a problem, but because of everybody else and all the noise and all the fear of what everyone else thinks, no, it's a problem. We're not going to talk about it. Um, quickly, too, just like with burnout, I am a product of this system, right? So I spend all day being like, mental health is normal. Meds are the same as my hypertension meds, la, la, la. But this, during COVID, there's this time where like a bunch of healthcare workers on Twitter, now X, but I refer to, I refuse to call it that, um, were like talking about their healthcare stories um, with mental health. And they were like, I am, I'm this person, this is my story, whatever. I basically said like, hey, I go to therapy. I felt good about that. I was like, that's a good thing to put out there. Um, but then I started reading like other people's and I realized how many people were mentioning meds. And like, I'd been on meds since college, no change, same medication, literally no reason to feel anything other than like, that's a thing that's been going on in my life for forever. And I'm watching all these other people talk about it and like, well, that seems bad that I can't say that or I or I filtered that for some reason. Like I'm a pretty open about this stuff. I'm definitely open about therapy. Like what is it about that? And so I thought pretty hard about it and kind of like landed on the same thing that those med students had, right? Like I don't think it's a personal weakness to get help. And I don't think that the things I'm telling my patients are lies, but I do exist in medical culture and I do worry that like someone's going to think that if I say I'm on, I, I've been on meds, I am on meds, that I was very sick at one point and I shouldn't be treating patients that I could get worse at some point and they can't handle me, right? Like all these things that like I had no idea were deep down in there came out of this Twitter thought process, right? But I think it's important the same way it is that I didn't recognize my own burnout. If we stigmatize ourselves as psychiatrists and we don't talk about our own our own treatment, we don't feel comfortable talking about it, we don't even talk to a peer about it, like again, why should anyone else? Like it just we're supposed to be sort of the beacons of this is normal, right? So what can you actually do about this stuff? So I'm very big on like it's a broken culture and I'm never not going to tell you that because like that is not true. <laughs> and so this is the culture we exist in. We have to think about how you can exist in it while other people are working to change it and the ways that are possible to change. Um, importantly, the ways to change this, however, are not the ways we tend to do it, which are like give people really silly presents. I'm a big fan of food and yoga, but they have a time and place, right? So if somebody's super burnt out and your solution is to give them food and yoga, they are going to hate you. If you told them that way earlier on, they might not be as mad at you. Um, these are real too. I, for some reason, we're really bad at giving nursing week gifts and people send me this stuff on <laughs> social media all the time. You probably can't read the middle one, but it says, it's a plastic bag and it says, I know this bag looks empty, but it's actually filled with our love and support. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just like, I don't even know how that gets out, right? Like somebody thought that was a good idea. And the other thing that people think is a good idea is giving burnt out nurses rocks. Like what are, what are they supposed to do with them? Like I can think of lots of things I would do with a rock if you gave me a rock and I was mad at you, but it's, it's the most bizarre solution. 
But we tend to like bizarre solutions because they feel like we're doing something or like we told them we were grateful for them. We're good. And um, that's really, really not helpful. Just as like a thing to know. Um, individually, I, I mentioned the how are you doing thing at the beginning because like I actually think when we don't ask, we end up being to where I was, which is like you're falling asleep every day after work. Something's actually wrong with you. There were lots of things I blew past along the way that I completely ignored. And if I had been paying attention to myself as a, a human doing the work, I would have noticed, right? And I think it's important either to ask yourself how you're doing or know what those measures are for you and pay attention to them. Me, sleep's a big one. Um, also, early sign of burnout for me is like, if someone sends me one more email, I'm gonna take my computer and I'm gonna throw it across the room. Like that's my reaction to emails. That reaction is, I don't want someone else to ask me for something, right? Because emails are usually asks or there's like something else to do. And so I know now that that reaction is actually an early sign of burnout because I've decided I have no capacity, but my like reaction is to be like, how dare these people write me and ask me a question, right? And so paying attention to that stuff is helpful because if you notice that early, then maybe I could have done yoga and maybe I would have been better than I was in, at the ultimately, right? Um, other big things to kind of pay attention to as like woo and cheesy as they sound, um, meaning and purpose are protective against burnout across the board. Who knows what meaning, meaning and purpose sounds so philosophically like grand and bizarre that answering what that really is is kind of hard. But I think like there is a reason you went into this. There are things that are your strengths. There are things you're proud of. And like being able to go back to that and center on that is really, really important. Like knowing what gets you out of bed in the morning is really, really important. The thing, the sort of like a diary blog thing on the, uh, the side is like one way to kind of think about what gives you energy and what doesn't. We spend a lot of time going like, I hate Mondays, Mondays are the worst, or I hate this rotation. But we don't like actually know what about that is the problem, right? We haven't like hour by hour looked at our time and gone, oh, I don't like Mondays because on Mondays I have this meeting and this meeting makes me angry. And then I go right from that into something else. And I also don't like that something else. And both of those things should not be back to back, right? And if you have any control over it, sometimes you can, or you can give yourself a little buffer space, right? Or you can say, I don't like that stuff, but I like this stuff. And I need to balance those two meetings I don't like with other things. Importantly, I think we tend to kick off the things that actually we like the most, the earliest. So across the board, people will say, I actually like mentoring and teaching and stuff. But at a certain point of burnout and a certain point of like, I can't do anymore, you start saying no to that stuff. because of course you do. One, you don't want them to know you're burnt out. And two, like, you just don't have the capacity. But actually, that stuff will tends to give you back energy in ways that you don't realize. And so kicking it off completely just leaves you with a bunch of stuff you hate. And so being able to say like, okay, I'm saying yes to this, but there's a reason to it. It actually makes me feel better. I'm not actually adding work is helpful to kind of pay attention to. Also within this important to know, like, guess what? Social media affects your mental health. Um, but I'm not one of these people who's going to, let's say, write an entire book about why social media is the devil. But I do think that it's important to be mindfully paying attention to social media. So we're in a field that the world affects our patients and they talk about it. It's very hard to not read the news. It's very hard to not be paying attention to like trends and the things that they're talking about because they're bringing it into you. So you should know. However, the news used to just be on like a couple, like 30 minutes a day and people did okay keeping informed. So that's one thing to pay attention to. Also, like, I don't know, we just scroll and read and don't notice like any of our feelings when that's happening. If you like are angry or you're noticing like you feel sad, maybe take a break. You don't have to keep going. <laughs> but for some reason, we aren't paying attention to that. I grind my teeth when I'm like scrolling and angry about something. So I started to pay attention to that and I'm like, oh, that's break time, right? It doesn't mean I'm saying like get rid of social completely or don't ever watch the news. That's like completely not helpful for what we do. But I am saying like it does affect you and it will affect you. So pay attention to that. I like this checklist because it includes like thinking about social media and taking a break from it as part of sort of like a checklist for the day. Um, but just something to notice. Another thing that can be helpful if you're like having trouble finding meaning and purpose is sort of this concept of three good things. Again, this can feel like, what is she telling me to do? How silly. But for 15 days, they text people two hours before bed and we're like, 
What were the three things like that were good about your day? What was your role in making that happen? And like, how did you feel? Right. So instead of like harping on that one patient who's really mean to you or the attending that's really mean to you or whatever, you're able to kind of reframe and say, oh, look, there was actually good stuff in my day. We have a bias to find the bad stuff because it used to tell us like those berries are poisonous and I shouldn't eat those berries. So we always paid attention to the negative, but it's really hard when all we pay attention to is the negative, right? The lens in which we're viewing stuff. So this sort of like helps you remember there are good things and it actually works. So I'm not telling you something just to tell you something. So in their data, for only 15 days responding to this text message, people had significant improvements and they're all almost health, healthcare workers across the board in their studies um, in emotional exhaustion, so burnout, depression and happiness at one month, six months and 12 months, right? So literally every single person, whenever I talk about this, like, you know, do something for your own mental health, they're like, I have no time. This is totally true. You have no time, but it turns out you only need to spend 15 days responding to a text message and it'll help, right? So there are things that we're just ignoring in this that don't take a lot of time that actually do make a difference that you can have control over. Um, and in the subgroup, the people who were worse off at the beginning actually seem to have better effects. Um, another way you can do this that I do it, that some people do it, is like anytime something good happens with a patient or they say something or you get a card, which doesn't happen very often in psychiatry, keep it. And when you're having bad days, go to that. I have a little box doesn't have a lot in it. I'm a psychiatrist. People aren't writing me thank you notes all the time. But even with like Epic, if somebody writes me something nice, I'll take off all the hip and then fun characteristics and I print it and I put it in there. Something from a mentee, stuff like that. If you're having a bad day, you go to the box or you can do what some people do and like scatter it throughout your house and go find it in surprise days. And that can also be nice. This is where you get that from. Um, you guys can have my slides. I'll tell them they can send it out. But this is like Duke made all of these. They're all wonderful. They're all with healthcare workers in mind. They're all super short and they're almost all through your phone, right? So I like all their stuff. They're made with healthcare workers in mind. They're made knowing that you're going to be cynical about every single one of these things. And they actually work and they have tons of data to show it because they also know you won't listen unless there's data. So that's a good place to go. Besides us, like what can we do sort of in our environment to kind of cultivate a better environment of caring? So beyond meaning and purpose, supportive work environment across the board is like the answer to all things. So can buffer against PTSD, decrease if a, a decrease odds of burnout, if you have trusting management, supervisor help, time, a workplace that supports productivity. Um, it also like having a supportive supervisor feeling valued can lower burnout significantly, right? And so then people are like, well, what does that mean? It's subjective, right, if you have a supportive supervisor, but really they're like, how do we train people to be able to not to be a supportive supervisor if they aren't one is important to consider. And in the same respect, like maybe we should be highlighting the people who do it really well. Um, and a lot of the times that reason that they're doing this really well is they're vulnerable in some capacity, right? I don't mean that everyone needs to get up in front of like their trainees and say like, hey, I'm Jesse. I take antidepressants when I was burnt out, right? Like somebody has to do that and somebody should do that. And I'm grateful to be the poster child for doing that. But you actually can be vulnerable saying like, medicine is hard. Apparently that's hard to say. Um, or like, you know, I remember when I had to take all those tests, it was really hard to balance that. Or I didn't sleep very well last night. Or uh, work-life balance is really hard in medicine, right? These are things that are like, shouldn't be hard to say but actually make someone know that you're capable to have those conversations a little bit better. And if you're vulnerable, um, courage and empathy are important characteristics in leadership, like no matter what workplace you're in. And you actually can't be creative if you're not open to failure and you're not open to being vulnerable, right? So you, if you want to do something like in research, you're gonna try something out. And if you're not able to do that because you're afraid of what could not work, you're not gonna try it out. And so a really important like characteristic to sort of like success in life is being able to be vulnerable. Plus, if you talk about stuff, people tend to talk about stuff and that makes a better environment for talking about things, right? On the other end too, burnout is contagious. I don't think this is like earth shattering for you to know because I'm sure if you've ever been around someone who's like burnt out, one of the things, right, like decreased productivity, you're holding all their work and then they're cynical. So then they're mean, so you're like holding their work and they're mean. And you're trying to say like, oh, I'm okay, right? That seems hard. So same people who did the texting uh, three good things study. If you are in an environment that's an emotionally exhausted climate, 
you have like basically like a 15 to 17% higher chance of also being launched. I think that makes sense, but there's lots of numbers there if you want them. Um, a bonus tip too is like getting help is not bad leadership. <laughs> getting help is good leadership. Modeling getting help is good leadership. There's really like no wrong time to do that. Um, if for some reason it always feels like that, but don't, don't worry about those kind of things. Um, these are lots of places that do um, stuff for physicians outside of your system that I'm friends with people. I've vetted them. Don't worry about it. This physician support line is staffed by psychiatrists. It came about during the pandemic. It's staffed, like I think, 8 a.m. to midnight. Um, still exists. It's called a support line, not a crisis line for a reason. I just want to talk to someone. Um, not in your institution. <laughs> um, some of the other things are like free therapy. Um, I think it's important to a psychiatrist that we continue to frame help seeking as almost like something that makes you better at your job, right? So instead of like therapy or something being like, I'm sick, I need to go get help, I have a problem, being like, oh, I'm actually doing this because it helps me understand myself, it helps me understand my job. And this is like a Carl Jung quote, which I think is like basically the reason to always go to therapy, which is like understanding your own darknesses makes it easier to understand the ones of other people, right? Um, and so, you know, if that's what it if, it, if it only helps to formulate it in your mind in that way, at least you can say, you can go because you're starting to help yourself be better at your job because we sure like to be good at our jobs. Um, thanks for letting me ramble on. I didn't leave a lot of time for questions because I'm classically like that, but um, <laughs> you can always email me. That's my email address. You can also find me on most social media platforms under that, which and you can DM me stuff if that's something you do. And that's my book. That's a code to get it cheaper if you want it. I asked for it because I said, if people have to listen to me talk for an hour, they should get a benefit. Um, that's where that came from. So in case you want it, also have Jenny send, send out the slides and it'll be in there too. Um, questions? Yeah. I know I'm looking at you. It seems right. You can, yeah. <laughs> All of the things that you I wanted them, but totally. Yeah, so first I also over over connect, but by the time I depersonalize, I depersonalize it's way down the like so I I'm an empath I suck in everything and then I realize I'm sucking in everything and then I go oh no I shouldn't be doing that and then I start doing things that aren't me which is like disconnecting so I sort of have both spectrums. Um, I agree with like everything you're saying about the system I, I hope. In, in, in talking about the individual, it's not to minimize the system. I never really try to do that because I don't think that's helpful, but I also think that a lot of the individuals in the room can't change the system. So it can feel very frustrating to be in a like, conversation where I tell you the solution is like epic and fixing epic because you're like, I don't know, what control do I have over epic, right? So when on the systems level, a lot of it has to do with electronic medical records. They're working at trying to find solutions to like make that better for people. Some places that's like 
scribes, but some places that's AI and they're trying all these ways to sort of like help minimize that. Um, you know, some of the systems at play to like insurance companies are not going away, right? And so that's like, how do you tolerate that? And if you can't, maybe you do need some time or you do need to figure out if that's what you want to be doing. Because I don't think that medicine looks like maybe most people think it's going to look like. And I think it's a worth a, a worthwhile exercise to consider. Policies are also big. Um, you know, I think there's very little mental health awareness in conversations that I've been in at a higher level when they're like thinking about leave or they're thinking about how to help someone in the workplace with remote work. Um, all of those things tend to be made without wellness or sort of like mental health in mind. And I think that's a big place that employers could be better. Um, you know, I think they also obviously need to be able to provide care and provide it cheaply and give you hours that you can actually access it. That seems like a baseline duh to me, but like that isn't always the case, right? Um, I think, but you're not wrong though, that like a lot of this is a system. I think the hard thing is that the system change is so, 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 so slow that like I could write a policy, but you're still burnt out. So I think it makes it really hard to feel as an individual that like anything I could do on a policy level can actually affect you, at least not in the short term. And I don't, I, and I like have nothing to say beyond to acknowledge that feeling because I think it feels really bad. I mean, it's why I'm doing what I'm doing is I felt that like I felt bad in a broken system and I needed to fix it. And so now I am, right? Like I'm doing the most I can by being in a role that could do that. But a lot of people like you don't want to add that on top of what you're doing. It shouldn't be what you have to add on to what you're doing. But like a lot of the policy changes are going to be so slow to happen and so slow to like actually affect you as an individual. Not a happy answer, but I also appreciate you sharing with me. Culture of medicine looks quite difficult to sustain in terms of efficiency. Have opinions about how medicine as a whole can make this dramatic more mm -hmm. Yes, I do. Um, so my role is one of my campuses is a health science center. The four other ones are regular universities where nobody has ever even like had a class ever on any of this stuff, right? They're making plans for all those college kids that you're hearing about that you see as patients, but they don't know any, they don't have anything that's a training in that. So we have different training, we have different expertise. We definitely don't know higher ed in the same way that they do. They have different experience, but we can bring that to a room in a really helpful way. I think, I think medicine in general is gonna have a sustainability problem uh, in, with Gen Z, um, just because of sort of expectations of the workplace and the culture in the workplace and sort of not caring as much about the reasons to go into academics like prestige, right? So I think we're sort of going to have to take a magnifying glass and look at ourselves if we want people to still stay in academics and still stay in medicine um, or even want to go into medicine, because I just feel like it's the things that drew people before are probably not the things that are going to draw the next generation. So we have to look now where we have a really, really hard time um, sustaining a workforce, especially a workforce that's well. So we are out of time for today, but I really, really want to thank you. This was exactly what I hoped you would be able to teach us. Um, the department has heard from me in the last department meeting that we really want to focus more on wellness. I've asked three of our faculty to really start a wellness committee. We're going to meet with them right after this. Um, there's a real commitment to this, and I really encourage everybody to share those thoughts, either with me, with the division directors, with the wellness committee. We will consider this to be the kickoff of a serious wellness effort, and we might ask you to come back in a year to see and then whether everyone's going to feel great. Have changed. <laughs> One, one, last, one last thought, Amanda's, Amanda's metaphor of the fish and the toxic pond. There's a lot there that we cannot really address at this point. And I, you know, of course, I now see this as a cheer and, and an administrative role. Most people solve their problem by going to a different pond, by controlling really well what goes into the pond to begin with, to be highly selective in exposing themselves to the moral injury and the burnout, and by doing so, decrease. Psychiatry does this more than any other medical discipline. That's what most people do. 
they avoid the problem by trying to solve it in the all the way in the beginning by excluding those problems. We cannot do that in an academic environment, particularly in a medical center where we are a tremendous resource for the community. We have to address this problem. And the only thing I can say is we have in Brené Brown's quote on vulnerability hit home for me. Vulnerability is showing up when you know you cannot change the system. How else can you be an anti-racist? You don't first agree that there's racism to begin with, and you continue to fight against it, knowing that the environment actually is racist. And then you can display racist with sexist or any other feature of the society that is broken. That requires advocacy. And that's something what I try to say in one of the last department meetings, diversity is really about us getting involved in advocacy. That's the counterpart. So wellness is about us. Wellness is about something that we need to do, but then the toxic bond is still there. And advocacy and political engagement the only one that we can actually do. That note. I would just say the pond was designed for a certain kind of person too, right? Like the pond, when you talk about racism, when you talk about sexism, like that's all going to contribute to the toxicity and the wellness because the pond wasn't just like designed for the people that are in it, right? Um, people had to like do drugs to do their job when they were, when they designed medicine. That means we probably should have slept more. Right. So, you know, that's a simple, really extreme example, but it wasn't designed that way. So, of course, it has to change. Okay. Thank you very of much. Of course. Bye.